So, Jeffrey, this is the, the uh, 200th birthday of Charles Darwin and the 150th anniversary of Origin of the Species. It's a little too late for us. You know, if you're really smart, do something in your 50th year that it's right, significant right, yeah, so that, yeah. that you can do that simultaneously. <laughs> do words and languages evolve like species do? You know, it's, it's a fascinating question, a comparison uh, that people have been exploring for a long time. Darwin himself was very much interested in, in language change. And then historians aren't sure whether he had actually read the work of a historical linguist like Franz Bopp, if you'll cast your mind back, who uh, a few, uh, about a generation earlier, had published on the historical evolution of, uh, of Indo-European. And then maybe Bopp himself was influenced by Linnaeus. And so it becomes one of those historical. Who are they? I'm an engineer. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but um, it, 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 it's fascinating grounds for comparison because on the one hand you think, well, language, I mean, it, it's it's the Lamarckian system, right? Language is something we do pass on, we acquire and pass on. If I grow up speaking uh, Danish and then my kids learn English, they pass on English. I mean, it's not it's not we're not bound to the language of our parents. On the other hand, there are resemblances in the way languages split off into new families and, uh, and new languages. And, and um, in fact, some people have looked at developments in evolutionary theory for very precise models of how language changes. There's a recent article in Science, for example, um, which was a theory of punctuated equilibrium in language, the idea being that just before languages uh, split into each other, there's this sudden increase in the number of new words that they form. And, and uh, so, so they've been very profitable ways of thinking about the similarities and differences between these two But systems. it's not exactly predictive. Yeah. No, uh, no. And, and, and of course, the, the one thing about languages is that unlike species, which really are, you have a sense that species are really out there, the difference between one language, between saying one, speaking of one language and two languages, people say, well, if they're mutually intelligible or not. But you often have one language defined over varieties that are actually quite unintelligible. Chinese, for example, is compre comprehends varieties from Cantonese to Mandarin that are more different than Romanian and Portuguese. On the other hand, you'll have two languages like. Uh, Danish and Norwegian and Dutch and Afrikaans, everybody says, or now Serb and Croatian, where everybody says, well, these are two languages. But actually, they're as close as uh, New York speech and, and Virginia speech. So, <laughs> so, so the, the line between languages isn't a natural line in the way the line between species is. Some people have said that uh, you know, the difference between a language and a dialect is a, a language is a dialect with a navy. <laughs> I see. <laughs> I see. It's like a college with a football team. That's yeah, different yeah, than the yeah. colleges without. Okay. Uh, I think what's interesting to me is that I just got back from the AAAS meeting in Chicago, and they had a whole session on the evolution and study of sign languages all over the world. And they were talking about how they start and they stop. You just get any group of people, and if uh, if in your family, you develop these signs. You'll use those signs the rest of your life. Then you move into, say, a group home or you go to college. Uh, then you'll adapt, but you tend to go back to your own. And then some of the, if, if you graduate and they're continuing with those and things come along like iPods and all that, then the sign language will get richer so that when the alumni return, they don't know, they can't speak mm -hmm. the language of the old. And yet, do we think that those kind of languages are the same as the kind of languages that we know that we speak with words? They're, they're remarkably similar. I mean, obviously, a, a language that's produced with one's hands and, 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 and gestures is not the same as a language that's produced with, with spoken. But they're remarkably similar, even, in, even down to the structure, the way pronouns work in those languages, or the way grammatical structures and tenses and aspect and other features of the, of the, the grammatical system of the language work. They're, they're, they're extraordinarily alike. And, what that suggests is that, first of all, we should think of language as something more abstract than just speech. Yeah. Language is this abstract capacity, which most of us, for various reasons, realize by making uh, uh, noises at one another, but which can equally well be realized in the form of, 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 of gestures or, 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 in the case of writing, by, by, by writing. So that's one thing we learn from the study of sign language, that it's language is way up here. And in fact, you, you get uh, cases, for instance, of sign language aphasia and di disorders when someone has a lesion in one of the hemispheres uh, that are very like uh, the disorders or analog quite analogous to the disorders you see in spoken language aphasia. Again, indicating that this 
language happens in the brain at a very abstract level and isn't, isn't directly connected to speech. We, know, we do know that language co-evolves with the times, and uh, I understand that the American Dialect Society chose bailout as the 200, 2008 word of the year. And so <laughs> didn't, didn't really, wasn't really so much up there before. Um, but I was also looking back, and of course there are many uh, organizations that uh, choose their words of the year for different reasons. Um, and the furthest back I could really get a, a digital technical term was 1993 was information superhighway. Boy, did that mm -hmm. start and end. Mm -hmm. Does anybody even say that anymore other than me right now? I, you know, I've been, I've been looking at those sort of how far back. And, and the, the, the interesting way in which um, the history of the 20th century, of, of, of one of the, the most interesting features of 20th century language in developed nations, uh, uh, languages like English and French and German and so on, is the way in which words have been born in the sciences and then, so to speak, dripped down the sides of the, trickled down the sides of the ivory tower into, into ordinary speech. I was looking the other day and said, well, when did, when did people start talking about feedback in a, not as a, as a technical term in, in cybernetics or, or uh, uh, but, but just in the sense, give me your feedback on that. It was actually about the, the, the 40s already, people were using it in that way. Uh, and other terms, certainly information itself, uh, has become almost a, a prefix, right? From information overload to information uh, science, uh, information too much glut, information. too much information, <laughs> uh, uh, the information age and, and information revolution. Uh, so the, these words do trickle down, and also from the social sciences. I mean, you look at the, all the words like peer group and status symbol and alienation and so on that are just part of the ordinary language of uh, everyday life now, but that had their origin uh, in, in sociology. One, one more that I was just thinking about the other day because I was thinking of doing a, a fresh air piece on it. I was looking to people are really upset about the Madoff story, of course, and they're, yeah. they're searching their inner lexicons for, for words they You've can use to denounce to. This, this, <laughs> this, this character and so on. And you hear scoundrel and rogue and bum, but actually the most frequent words that people use to describe them are psychopath and sociopath. Both of them fairly obscure words of uh, psychological theory uh, uh, a couple of generations ago. So just another case where our ordinary language has been derived from, from science. Well, that's interesting you say that about the psychology because, in fact, I remember, mm, I'm, I'm going to say like 15 years, 15 to 18 years ago, people started saying passive-aggressive. So-and-so was passive-aggressive. And I remember at the time saying, oh, did you see that? That was passive aggressive. And I was like, oh my goodness, that person has really figured out how to spot it, and, you know, because I always felt like a victim. And then a couple of years went by and I figured the whole thing out. Um, and so it's like, the, it's, it's not just the word, the word represents behavior. And so mm -hmm. it brings not just a description of a sort of a one or two dimensional kind of thing, it brings action in addition into uh, what people's behavior that we certainly didn't talk about prior to that. And, and a new way of understanding things. You yeah. think of the way behaviors redefined when we, so we used to have drunks, now we have alcoholics. Now that isn't just a shifting of one word for another. It's a very different understanding. But what we was didn't a, have alcoholics. They were just people who did other things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but it's a different understanding of, of, of what causes this and how we should think about it and so forth. It's true that when these words slip into the language, they tend to lose their, you know, some of their scientific, pers I mean, I'm looking at, at, the, at the word sociopath, for example, it's applied to everybody from uh, 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 Obama to, uh, to, to Bush to even, uh, even, even Dick Cheney gets called a sociopath. I'd say even because you look at the list of criteria for sociopath and one of them is supposed to be superficially charming. Right. <laughs> Why are we using this word of Dick Cheney? But uh, the, so the words do acquire a different sense in the language, but but they do come to, to trickle down, as, as I was saying. From the... I was looking, and it's been it's been almost fifteen years since the first time you came on the show, which is hard to believe, but it's like that's been that long. Oh, and cool. one thing that has happened in your uh, discovery and investigation of language that has certainly changed things is. I very much remember the time you came in and you started saying, and I was checking this on Google and I was counting words on Google. Suddenly Google was Jeffrey Nunberg's best friend. Oh, Google has, well, Google and all of the data, because it isn't just Google. Yeah. All of the databases we have going back historically where we can go look at newspapers going back into the 18th century and, and, uh, and English literature and, and, uh, and have completely changed the way people do lexicography and dict you think of the Oxford English Dictionary as the great achievement of 19th century of, of 
any lexicography. This vast book, thousands of volunteer readers sitting there just transcribing the citations on little slips of paper and sending them to Murray and, the, uh, and his children in the, the back in a metal shed in the backyard of his house at Oxford where they were laboriously compiling them into this, this dictionary that at the end, when it was finally prepared, had, 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 had used four million citations with more than a million actually cited in the dictionary. Extraordinary. It took decades, generations to, to finish this project. Well, four million citations, I can, you know, with a few strokes of uh, keystrokes, I can pick up four million citations for the single word dictionary now. I can go back and I can look in the o OED, or the Oxford English Dictionary, I can see, well, the first citation they have for this word is, let's say, 1960. Well, the protest march in the Oxford English Dictionary is first cited in 1961. Turns out, if you do, now we have all these databases online, you go back, it was actually used in 1912 by Gandhi in referring to the organization he was doing in, in South Africa. So over and over, uh, over and over again, you find these expressions, double standard, we thought originated in the 50s, actually goes back to the 1920s. So, the, the, the people who are word lovers and who make these dictionaries and so on have completely revised the way we think about the, particularly the recent history of English because we have all these databases available. And it really brings home how much we've handed down language between us in all these mm -hmm. generations. Right, and, and you can also look in, in, on Google and watch these words suddenly explode into... Uh, into like into, truthiness. Like truthiness, right? <laughs> <laughs> One day there's nothing, and all of a sudden there's... There's truthiness. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thing, because when I say technology, it's a very broad definition. It's if God didn't make it, it's technology. And uh, so media technology, some of it's digital, some of it's not, but the thing is media technology has really become ubiquitous. And truthiness, you know, if it wasn't for Stephen Colbert, we wouldn't have truthiness having made that impact that quickly and meaning something. It's, it's interesting, but the, the, the other side of media, the, the role of the media in language, is that while the media create enormous numbers of words very quickly, they also tend to evanesce very quickly. Uh, words I hate born word. on television uh, <laughs> tend not to live very long. And you think of the, um, oh, I made a list of all the, all the famous phrases that came from television. How many of them are still around? You bet your sweet bippy and... Uh, um, uh, who it could be true. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> but what was the Kojak line? Who loves you? Uh, who loves uh, you, baby? Who loves you, baby? This long list of, of phrases that nobody ever uses. The only one, beam me up, Scotty. It's about the only one that's still still in English language. I was going to say they're uh, looking when I was looking on the on the internet for these you know words of the year. One of them was not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So the media, the media create all these words. They 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 go off into the atmosphere, and and and, and they, they rarely survive when the show goes into reruns. The, the words they tend to the vanish. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they jump the shark. Right. Really, exactly. Right, right, yeah. Exactly. Now I was looking desperately for how science could affect things, you know, because of Darwin. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, gee, maybe science has. And the only thing I could pick up is in 2006, people started using the word "you've been plutoed," as in demoted. Right. Right. But right. Right. I didn't. I couldn't find anything that really was it to this date. Um, that really said that you know we understood something about science. Like it was, it was that was more like the media event, if you will, mm -hmm. driving it, as opposed to we have an appreciation for what's going on. It's really you know, interesting. For me. I, I think science is always, particularly modern technology. I mean, modern now since the 19th century has had an effect on 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 English and other languages, and building up ahead of steam or letting off steam or. Um, running on all cylinders, or uh, the point of no return, which is, of course, the point beyond which an airplane can't return to its, uh, its, uh, its home field, or uh, uh, any, any number of these, 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 these phrases that came from galvanized, for instance, a, a, a yeah. terrific word that we, we don't associate with, with its original meaning anymore, but comes, of course. And what like, is the original meaning? The original meaning is, is um, to, uh, to uh, uh, use electro electrolysis, isn't it? You're, you're the engineer. Don't, I'm don't testing test him. Yeah. I don't yeah. usually get to, you yeah, see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the electrolysis, and then it makes the whole, the whole metal uh, very right. strong. Right. So it's been uh, galvanized so, and rigid. So mm -hmm. there you are, and you've been, we galvanized, you know, I got it strong. Right. Thing, so. <laughs> But um, the interesting thing about computers is that it isn't simply a question of making these metaphors that are sometimes vivid and colorful but don't really instruct or, or shed any light on anything. With, uh, with computers, we tend to make these metaphors that actually reflect an understanding of what's going on inside us. So when you say, for instance, I can't multitask, 
you're modeling, or I'm having trouble multitasking, you're modeling your own mental processes on, on what you observe the, com the, the computer doing. And that's a very different way of uh, of No, it's of really it. interesting you would say that because computer scientists for many years uh, did multitasking within <laughs> operating systems, like from the mid-60s when the big, large operating systems first started coming on. And that was, a con that was something that we understood. And then for years you had paper and sort of like continuous paper and sort of typewriters. And then we went to screens, but they were mostly just letters. And it wasn't until we got to the Macintosh and the Xerox, the work of Xerox Park, where suddenly you could have, can you imagine not having different applications all up on your screen now, what we call the that, that kind of a GUI interface, a graphical user interface. Once we had that and we had the sense that multiple things could go on and you could, you know, send something to printer while you're doing all of a sudden everybody really got the the word we'd always used was multitask. Now it may be simultaneously with something else, but that's when I really saw people who never knew what the technical word meant suddenly got what the word meant. And that would put us in the mid nineteen eighties. I guess the mid nineteen eighties. There, there were people who used to talk back then about get, don't give me a core dump. Do you remember that? Especially? Yeah, they've stopped and that, saying that. That survived, that's but, but it survived core memory by about 20 years. Core memory disappeared <laughs> yeah. about 19, 1975, and they, yeah. were, they were still yeah. talking about don't give me a core dump as, as, as late as yeah. 2000. Yeah. yeah, same people are still saying it now. It's like, hmm. <laughs> don't listen to those. Now, I, you know, so I've, been, I've been saying these words of the year, and what I, uh, one of the things I was interested in is a lot of times they reflect what just happened, sometimes, you know, with a guidance of big media explosion or, or massive adaptation. But in some cases, they predated it. Like the word web was 1995, but it wasn't until 1997 that with actually within a couple of weeks of each other, both the White House and Mickey Mouse got their first website. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the real implementation and, and ubiquitous adaptation succeeded it by several years. So the how, how how would you say that yeah word? no that, that's also very interesting and, and again something that with the uh, the databases we can we can track now because it often happens that a word is first introduced I said this word goes back to 1912 but what what matters really is not so much the first time the word occurs but the moment at which it catches on take a word like uh, like lifestyle lifestyle actually first entered the English language in 1929 it came from Adlerian psychology it was a technical term and was kind of around in the psychological literature for, for, for about four decades. And then suddenly in 1969, if you plot the frequency of this word, it shot up a thousandfold because of Charles Rice Greening of America and, and, and so forth. Now, does it matter when the word was first introduced? No, it's a word of the 60s. Uh, yeah. and, and even if it existed before that, that's when it caught on. And I, I think this is the same with, 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 with a lot of the language that we talk about it. The, the important thing is at what moment did this become the, the hot expression, uh, not 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 when was it first pronounced. Now we're at a time where all these people, everybody's texting each other. We got Twitter. We got text messages. We got, and you know, you say you for you. And has how does that change words as we know it? I mean, if the word word of the year is you for y o u, are they? Is that just like a whole separate little language? You know, it's it's interesting. Um, uh, every technology that involves communication. Um, people have always looked to expecting it to work these profound changes in, in the English language. I, I dug out an article about a year ago by a fellow named Conrad Swackhammer that was written in 1848, <laughs> a few years after the telegraph had come in and, and, and revolutionized uh, uh, communications, was going to change the world. People would be drawn closer. There would be no nations anymore. Uh, commerce would be on a entirely, I mean, people were saying about the telegraph with just as much reason as about the internet that this was going to fundamentally change the nature of, of, of human civilization. And necessarily, Swackhammer said, uh, just change the language as well. The language would become efficient and brief and terse and and, uh, and no longer ornate. And <laughs> and this is 50 years before Henry James is, <laughs> is, is writing. He was, as it happens, the first man to use the word telegraphic to describe speech and, and, and language. Uh, so so um, you always have to be careful in, in predicting these changes. And people have said about uh, texting, for example, that... Uh, uh, it's going to be the end of the English language, the end of the sentence as we know it, and, and uh, uh, 
Well, well speaking of end of sentences and telegraphing, mm -hmm. I went, this is back in the old days, years and years and years ago when I was in college, one summer, all the college roommates, we went to Hawaii for a week. And if you're going to go to Hawaii for a week and you're in college, on day six, you've run out of money, <laughs> right? <coughs> so on day five, you know, and this is before everybody had these tele you know, credit cards and ATMs. And, I mean, you really were in another world. And I remember calling my parents, collect, Chris, that's what you did. And I said, I need, I need some money. And, and my, my dad said, well, how much? I said, well, $50 would get us all through the rest. And he goes, okay. He goes, there's no reason for everybody not to wire, all the parents, I'll wire you the $50 and you girls come home. And I said, okay. So I, um, I wire, so when you wired money in those days, you got a 16, a free 16 word telegram. <laughs> I wish I'd kept it, you know, but it was like, word, word, stop, word, word, stop, you know, and I thought, there's got to be an entire language of the telegram that rose and then went away. It, it, it was for many years that the model of, of efficient speech, and in fact, some people have suggested that the, uh, the, the contractions uh, of Soviet speak, Sovnarkom and Komsomol and so on, all came from the telegraph, which in turn... Uh, gave rise to a certain kind of language of science, which in turn gave rise to phrases like cyberspace and William Gibson and so on. It, it all began with the with the uh, uh, with, with, with the telegraph. So uh, the, the telegraph had an enormous effect on language. It just it, it took a while, and now people are looking to texting and expecting. Uh, President to, Obama has his black. This little uh, yeah. everything. Now I'm not so sure that that the, the English language is going to change profoundly because kids who used to pass each other notes uh, on, on paper in, in math class are now texting it with their thumbs. I, I don't know how big a difference that makes. But, but, uh, uh, but certainly people are looking to these technologies to change the, the, the language itself. Now what's interesting for me is that you and I both write commentary or reports for the radio. And there are many times most of our writing we do for people to read, which is different than writing for people to, to speak on the radio. Let's first of all reveal sort of the technology background. I mean, for five minutes, um, there's a lot of rappers, and we actually have three transitions. And so I write 625 words, plus or minus 10, uh, and break it into, you know, with two transitions there. And I know they'll be able, I just go in and read that, and they wrap it up into everything else. You don't have a, a real hard line there, don't they? Just sort of fit you into fresh air, or, or well, do they? they? It's uh, uh, three three minutes twenty seconds, give or take. <gasps> so you, know? you and, do. And I, I always try to take. And it's they, funny they, that they you would say that. Yeah, yeah, it's like because three minutes twenty seconds is about what I got out of out of. Uh, I have to write for it because everything else is wrapper on one end or the other. So and people who have written um, to to a to a to a to a. To a fixed limit, whether it's uh, uh, for, for a three and a half minute radio piece or a 1500 word column or 700 word column, learn certain techniques uh, of, of writing that, that are forced by the, the, the compact space of the medium. And one of, one of the things I wonder is, well, now we've got, you know, the internet just, you just roll on and on and on and on. There's no, uh, you know, when newspapers go online, you can just keep forever. writing. There's no, the print doesn't cost anything. The paper doesn't cost anything. You can keep going on and on. And when, where will people learn that discipline uh, once they can, they can continue uh, yeah. So you, you pretty much know by the speed of how fast you read how many words you have to write for yeah. three minutes, yeah. 20 yeah. seconds. And you don't have any transitions. You just go straight through. No, radio, radio, Sam, as, as you know, radio is very interesting because you, it's, it's really very different from writing for, for print. I mean, for one thing, you come to the end of a, of a, you come to the end of a column in a, in, a, in a newspaper, and you can see that we're getting near the end of the page, and there's a little, maybe a little square just to indicate that, you know. That, but on radio, you have to sort of announce that the end is coming with a, with a, a, a and then you have to have a, 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 a snapper at the end that says, okay, <laughs> yeah, we're snapper. finished. And, so. and people also, I think, they perceive it very differently. When I, when I was first doing fresh air pieces, uh, I used to do two or three at a time, and then they would run, run them just all, I never knew when they were going to run them. And um, uh, pe people, you know, have, well, they get into their cars and they turn on the radio and they listen and then they get out of the car and they forget everything. It's like dreaming, you know, and then you get out of your car, it's like waking up. <laughs> so they would, they would, uh, they would, I would see friends, they say, oh, I heard you on the radio yesterday. Was, I said, oh, which, which piece was it? And there'd be a they long it, pause yeah. and they say, well, you know, I was turning left off ninth onto Folsom. <laughs> <laughs> you must, you must get this. Yeah, I get it yeah, all yeah, the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is, it is interesting because you're, you're speaking. So if you're, 
if you're going to say a word, you know, if, you, if you're scanning a page and you know that there's a word that's kind of strange, um, they'll stop and you'll look at the word. Well, there's no stopping on the radio. You know, you've got to, I always say, um, if, you, if you run into a word you've never seen before, we know your brain will go up to about a second and a quarter, uh, searching its Rolodex in the old days, searching its Rolodex, searching its database, for do I know this word or a word like it? And after a second and a quarter, you'll just quit. Now, what most people don't realize is that during that second and a quarter, um, number one, your hearing goes out. You're completely engaged <laughs> in what's this word, and then you're also engaged, in, and, and you have no sense the time has passed. You know, it's like when you're having a good time, time goes like that, bad time, it just goes so slow. So if I say, Jeffrey Nunberg um, uh, never beats his dog, and you know, like Jeffrey Nunberg, and then you get in the beats his dog. We used to get calls that, you know, I heard it on NPR, Jeffrey Nunberg beats his dog. And it's like, we used to say, no, you didn't hear that. Now we say, that may be what you heard, but that's not what was said. <laughs> so we have to, we have to take that, the, the sense of that little, little bit of timing in there. And if it's a, you find yourself saying it's, you know, it's, if you write it, you might say Intel Corporation Inc. You'd never say ink on the in the commentary. Mm -hmm. So you got the reading and the writing, and and the and the the motion sort of with the the rhythm. And as you say, a snapper at the what's end. What's interesting is the way language, as you do it, adapts itself. Your language adapts itself to each of the media that that you're using. So that if you've done radio, you start to talk for radio, write for radio, think for radio. Similarly for print, and similarly, for example, for even for people who don't do journalism or radio work or something for, for email, for example. It's, it's astonishing to me how quickly the conventions of email evolved, if I, if I can use that word, uh, so that people at a certain point uh, realize, well, dear Jeff, that's a little formal for email, and that hi uh, became <laughs> yeah. the... When, I, when, I was, when, I, when, was, when email first hit France, this was the, um, the early 90s. Um, well, the Minitel. The, the, the mini, but before the Minitel, just after the Minitel, the, the, the people were, were doing email, and I, I was in France, and I had these uh, keys on my, on my keyboard bound to long expressions I would use, at the, because they, they expected, you know, I dare to hope you will do me the courtesy of a reply, the honor of a reply, you know, that, <laughs> these I long expressions. You know. <laughs> but quickly we realized that, um, uh, and sincerely, uh, and uh, uh, valedictions of that sort disappeared, and cheers, suddenly somebody pulled out of, uh, out, out of nowhere and put in there. It, it, the whole form of the man, you began to realize that more than a screen, you, had, you needed to break up a, 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 rather than sending a long email, you'd send three or four different messages with each with a screen full of information. And all of that evolved almost instantaneously and became very universal. And you can still tell if somebody's just come online, if there are such left, that they, they say, dear so-and-so, and they say sincerely, and they, they write. Uh, too many screenfuls in, 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 in like a all those email. emails that they they're going to send us a million dollars from Nigeria. Right. Yeah, those right, are all right. quite formal. That's like a real letter, <laughs> real letter that, that that's yeah. out there. Now I had to. I thought it was interesting. For instance, the uh, when I did my book, uh, I took uh, uh, sections of interviews. It's not, certainly not an interview book, but sections out of the biotech nation interviews because people were literally <coughs> explaining biotech, literally explaining science. And my rules are, you get one weird word in a segment. And after that, you're out of there. Nobody's going to listen. And so I forced all these people who really, great scientists who really knew what they were talking about to what I would call cocktail party descriptions. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Accurate, it's very accurate. And it worked when that went from speaking back to the written word. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was amazing how good it worked because people are actually, I think, and this is just a, a thought on my part, speaking um, directly, they want you to understand and they know how to kind of drop down into, I'm gonna tell you this in words you know. Mm -hmm. It's like there's like languages within languages. And then I was uh, thinking, you know, in your, in your nuclear, <laughs> yeah. now explain about nuclear, where that came from. Well, that, that is, 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 it's one of those interesting shibboleths uh, that people have about people who say nuclear instead of nuclear. I have to think now. To, to, uh, <laughs> uh, and of course, Bush uh, was was taxed with uh, with uh, with ignorance and everything else for saying nuclear. I, I tend to, well, Bush, I don't know, but but I, I, I tend to uh, 
to, to, to be less harsh on that pronunciation than, uh, than, than other people do. I think of, um, uh, what's the movie with the Mia Farrow, the Woody Allen film with Mia Farrow. She's like, I could never mar mar marry a man who doesn't know how to pronounce nuclear. She's like, yeah. But it, it stands in for, uh, for, uh, for a whole set of uh, shibboleths that people have about language. You have to say this word this way and, 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 and so forth. That's right. And so in that end, it's like we have, you know, while I've got these people trying to explain this really simply, on that end, there are words that we may even mispronounce and we use all the time, but we know what they mean no matter what they say. It's like mm -hmm. both pronunciations, we get it. They're the same word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, which is interesting. Now, are we about ready for questions here? I know I, people are great. Okay, so you've got the, you've got your, your um, uh, microphone, right? Perfect. And so, if you just raise your raise your hand, Lisa will come down. Oh, every just if you wonder about the audience, they will all be here. And please wait for the microphone to come. That would be great. Right, right up in front, we have one, and then uh, you can be looking back and get ready here. Hi, I just was wondering um, if you make distinctions um, by age. For instance, I notice a lot of language comes out of young people that I'm no longer in that category, but there are a lot you of young- really young to me. Thank you, darling. But uh, uh, there's a lot of language and even fractional bits of language that sort of evolve, whether it's technological language or, or whatever. I, I'm a, a fan of dignation and, and the, the stories that are constantly coming up there. And there's a lot of times I don't understand some of the things that they're describing because they're technical or in an area of science I don't get. Do you find that um, there's a whole culture of youth language surfacing that's coming from people who are um, maybe understanding technology and, and language at a different level? Sure, uh, lang language has always, lang lang language change is always richest in, uh, uh, among youth, the, 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 the small children uh, are the ones whose mispronunciations become a generation later the standard pronunciation of, of, of the language. And adolescents, of course, um, in their enthusiasm, in their desire not to sound like their parents, in fact, not to sound like anything their parents might understand, um, uh, produce new words and new slang, and that just enters the language. And, 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 and happens nowadays, perhaps with the help of the media, with astonishing rapidity. So one day in 1986, Every adolescent girl in America woke up one morning and said, as if, right, it, just, it <laughs> happened one morning. Uh, and, and it, you know, that didn't come from 57-year-old from, from bank examiners, right, who, it, 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 it bubbles up. Great. Next. Up here. And just keep your hands up so that so that Lisa can see where she can strategize, where she can go next. Great. Would you have anything to say on the influence uh, now, but over the years, of the day-to-day -day talk of um, of disc jockeys, particularly um, the morning people uh, who have been supremely uh, influential in, in radio, going back to Arthur Godfrey and now up to Howard Stern. Does this, does this strike you as anything? It's there, I mean, what's going yeah, no, on? No, I think radio talk has been interestingly influential, and, and as you say, it's a line going back to, to Arthur Godfrey and before, to the 1920s and 30s, when radio first became a, an important cultural force in America. And it's going on now, certainly with political, uh, political radio in, in very interesting ways. I do listen to political radio, and mostly right-wing radio, because that's mostly what there is. And, I think it's fascinating uh, the way these people talk. I was listening to Limbaugh this morning, and he's extraordinarily gifted uh, at just doing this endless monologue uh, that keeps people <laughs> entertained and engaged and a little bit infuriated and, and, and so forth. And interestingly, one difference I noticed between Limbaugh and your ordinary NPR uh, uh, ordinary. Uh, host, um, the, the, the host on NPR always addresses his or her listener in the singular. If you go home and get yourself uh, a, a, a new such and such, but it's always in the singular. Um, for Limbaugh and Hannity and so on, it's always you guys, you all. And wow. the impression is, 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 is of not of the speaker addressing each listener, so to speak, individually, but rather of addressing a, a collection of people all at once. Um, it's, it's a difference. If you listen for it, you'll hear very striking. Stern does this too, but 
you'll hear very strikingly between certain kinds of AM talk guys, mostly, and, uh, and NPR people, and, and, and implies a very different sense of how the communication's working and, and who's talking to who. You know, when I write my commentary, I'm writing to a person. I might be talking about everybody, but I'm writing to one person, and, and that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly reflected there. You know, speaking of the radio issue, when television came along, they said radio was going to be dead. Now we have one newspaper after another folding. Do you think we'll be done with newspapers in any kind of a malleable form, be it cornstarch or wood? Uh, it sure looks that way, doesn't it? Uh, it's <laughs> it's feeling scary. That way right I, I, now. I talked to my class at Berkeley just um, just uh, last week, and, and we were talking about all the ways we use our literacy. I said, well, raise your hand, tell me all the different ways you use your literacy in the, in, in, before you came here. And they got the picture. You know, I looked in my wallet to see how much money I have. I read my alarm clock. I checked my BART ticket to see if I had uh, uh, money left on it and so on. I said, and there were about 50 or 60 kids there. I said, how many of you sat down in the morning and read a newspaper? And, and these are all Berkeley undergraduates. I mean, they're not, they're, they're highly literate kids. Not one of them raised a hand. You know, when I was in college, in graduate school, I didn't read newspapers. I didn't read newspapers until much later. And my life sort of changed. I became more mm -hmm. of an adult. Were they all, were, you know, I'm trying to figure out whether were they never reading newspapers? I mean, no, I think they get their news online. They, they look at, I don't know who, 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 who they expect to pay for the New York Times, the Washington Post, or, or Wall Street Journal that they read on. For, mom for and their, dad. Well, <laughs> mom and dad, but who, who's going who's gonna to pay all those reporters to sit in Sacramento and Washington and so on? But so they did, these, are, these are, as I say, Berkeley undergraduates. They're interested in, 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 in the news and world affairs. They just don't read newspapers. Yeah. So they get it. So they say, great, next. There we go. Um, well, I don't think we have enough time for me to address your scurrilous comments about Henry James. But <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm wondering, though, language has always grown new words and then had them drop off. Um, nobody today cares about bees, knees, or anything like that. But um, we now have all of this. Um, technology that sort of runs together and seems to speed things up. And I'm wondering if you see that as something that's just going to speed up the process that always happens, or if it's actually going to change the process somehow. Um, let me first say about Henry James, just to, uh, that <laughs> James was fascinated by the, um, by, by the telegraph. Uh, if, you, uh, if you read Portrait of a Lady, there, there's a, I can't remember her name, Isabel Archer's uh, uh, aunt. Um, is is a devotee of writing these incomprehensible telegrams that Ralph and his uncle sort of try to uh, understand. He, in fact, wrote a wonderful story called In the Cage uh, about a, a, a woman who works in a telegraph office who's reading these telegrams between a, 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 a man and his sweetheart and, and isn't sure what role to play. So James was fascinated by the telegraph and by telegraphic language. He just didn't write that way. Uh, and um, as far as the pace of change, it's certainly the case that the media churn out, although a lot of language does bubble up, other language is created by the media and uh, uh, spreads very rapidly, is rapidly diffused and rapidly uh, disappears. Um, every, uh, every one, of, one of the most interesting ways of forming words in English or in other language uh, is uh, by making what are called portmanteau words, where you blend two items together. One of the first is um, uh, gerrymander, was one of the first of these words. There are now hundreds and thousands of those words uh, in English, from uh, uh, monokini to jazzercise to the names of corporations like Microsoft. I mean, if you just pick up a newspaper, you'll see thousands and thousands of words like that. Every one of them a media creation. Nobody ever sitting around the breakfast table coined a word like that and used it among his or her friends. So, so it, it's an indication of the degree to which, beginning with, by the way, with gerrymander, which was a media creation in the early 19th century, it's an indication of the way to which the media has taken a role in, in shaping the language. Well, how about dictionaries? I mean, what's happening to them? You just sit there and you write, you type your word online. I mean, you don't go over and get your big book anymore and open it up. I mean, there's no, they used to need to sell that big hunk to make the whole economy work. Yeah, it's not clear. I, I, I was associated for many years and still I'm with, with the American Heritage Dictionary and, and the dictionary has not fallen off in, in sales as, 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 quite in the way the encyclopedia has. The print encyclopedia is, is 
gone. finished, gone. Uh, they're never going to publish another edition of the Britannica. They still sell print dictionaries. I don't know whether just for some, I mean, what are you, you can't give somebody a floppy disk or whatever for his, you know, uh, for his bar mitzvah, right? Yeah, you need a, <laughs> you need, you need a book. And the, the print dictionary does have a symbolic function that you miss online. The, the, um, when the American Heritage first came online, this many, many years ago, and I actually had to install it in my machine. I had about 18 floppies and had to. Oh, that's you know, right. That's that, that's <laughs> if, you, right. if you remember that. Uh, and I, I was sitting in my office, and uh, a, a friend came in and says, it's such and such a word, I can't remember what it is. And uh, I said, gee, I don't know, but let's, I just, as it happened, just got my dictionary installed on my machine, so let me see if it's a word, and I typed the word in, and it said, it's, it's not in this dictionary. In fact, nothing like it is, is a word, because this looks for similar words. And he said, well, how big is that dictionary? Now, I knew, because I was associated with the American Heritage, I said, there, there are 182,000 boldface entries in this dictionary. That's something most people couldn't tell him. He says, well, how big is that? And I pulled the big folio size American Heritage from the side of the, the, the desk, and I thumped it down, thump, on the desk. I said, it's not in this dictionary. And he said, oh, then it's not a word. It's no. not a word. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't do that with a dictionary online. No. Now we have another question right here. OK, great. Over here. Oh, yes. I, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, the first time I heard somebody say computer geek, I, I thought to myself, you know, I don't like that sound. It sounds terrible. I'm going to go look it up and found out that geek actually has a derogatory meaning as an original expression. So do you think the people who adopt, adapt, adopt words like geek and apply them to themselves know what they're doing? Or is it, is it uh, based on complete ignorance? We know. I'm going to take that as the technical as the technical person here. Um, it sounds funny here, but uh, what I've found is that people who are really technical, who are what we really would think of as geeks, don't like the word geek. They find it's a pejorative. But people who want to assume technical uh, qual you know credentials that they don't have, oh, they're geeks. You know, they're geeks. I'm a super user. You know, who sold you that? You know, what was that about? So there's this adaptation of somebody once told me uh, who was trying to get into being a science reporter. Uh, she once said, I'm just a science groupie. <laughs> you know, and I, I was all, all I could do not just say, you are a political science major. You're not a science groupie. That's not science either. You know, <laughs> it was like nobody who had, you know, took more than two, two courses in science would consider themselves a science groupie. They'd sit down and try to learn some science. So what we do is we get, I think, from, uh, in, that there's the, we, the, 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 same, the word that may mean something in the popular culture, when you finally get closer and closer to people actually doing it, then those differentiations start to, um, start to, to fall out. Hacker is another word. Um, a hacker inside the tech community has nothing to do with ethical or unethical use. It has to do with your level, level of capability and how close you can get to the bits and the bytes and the machines and the inside. Um, and on the outside of the tech community, that's the unethical people who are working to break into computers. So, the, so again, two, same word, similar in the similar area, but two different meanings depending on how close you are. Do you want to say something about that? Well, no, I, 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 I agree. There, the, the, the geek is one of these words. People who have adopted the word, there, there's, um, there's a phrase linguists use called uh, reclaimed epithets, where a group <laughs> takes a word that was originally used pejoratively and says, yeah, I'm queer and proud of it, for example. Uh, Dyke, uh, in Dykes on Bikes, was, 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 was saying, look, uh, we, we're going to take this word and make it our own and so forth. And geek has some of that quality. People who say, I'm proud to be a geek, although a geek was somebody who originally bit heads off chickens and so on. There was a pop song a couple of years ago called The Geeks Get the Girls. I can't remember the name of the group, though. Somebody here Wishful thinking, yeah. lyricist. <laughs> By any definition. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Next. Right there, okay. I have a two-parter. Uh, one is, um, one of my favorite words is phony, and that is a technologically um, oh, linked I word. Is it not? You know, I don't know. I should know. I know it. Um, I thought uh, I learned it, it, it from you. It dates from the, the late <laughs> 1930s, and I don't know why, but it, how it, whether it's connected to phone or how it's connected I'd, to phone. I'd, and so on. It's connected to the phone, no mm -hmm. icon. Oh, phony, no eye contact. I or just see. the sound of the voice did not sound like um, yeah. it had. 
Oh, Perhaps, it's, and it's yeah, phony. I, I don't know. Yeah, some something's uh, inauthentic about that. Yeah. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you is, are there brand new languages? I mean, we're talking about usage here, by and large, but is Spanglish a new language? Well, if, if you think of a, it depends, of course, what, what you call a language, and I say it's not a technical term. Linguists don't, there's no, there's no technical test for deciding when something's become a language. Um, Spanglish to the extent um, that it's an unstable uh, uh, variety spoken by people who speak both English and Spanish as the, the more standard community language, um, isn't really a, a, a probably a language of its own. What, what, does, what has to happen for a language to form is that a community has to be constituted around a form of speech that's somehow broken off uh, from the, the original community. And, and then very rapidly you'll get new changes. That's what happened, for example, with the Creole uh, 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 languages, the, what, what, what we, we think of as Creoles now, where you had, for example, slaves taken from Africa, from various tribes who didn't speak any language in common, um, who were thrown together uh, and took the roots of the English or Spanish or French vocabulary, depending on when it, when it was, combined it with elements of common African grammar and formed these Creoles that were really new languages in that sense. And it's, it's a very interesting process. English, some people say, may have gone through a stage of Creolization at the time of the Norman Conquest. And one, obviously, that's interesting to linguists precisely because it does shed some light on the origin of language, which is something about which we have no direct evidence. But we don't have any new ones emerging right now. Well, languages might be emerging. It's, 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 it's hard we to don't know. know. We don't know. Yeah. We, we, there's, it's, it's very hard to say. OK, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. OK. You talk about talking points. I think that language, public language, has become much more, I wouldn't say necessarily formal, but much more prepared, such that um, when you turn on a news show or something, uh, you get, you're much more likely to get a pitch than the kind of conversation that you're having now. Um, and this seems to me to be a trend that, that's happening more and more. So is, is that? Well, you know, it's interesting you would say that. I like how you said a pitch. Um, I'm always watching how people are talking, you know, so we're having this, Jeff and I are having a conversation, we're having a conversation, and both of us kind of turn to you and say, let me explain a little about this, and, 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 and that's almost like an informal teaching mode in the best sense of teacher, you know, not standing up in the front of the room, and I'm going to give you the lesson for today, but we, we really want <coughs> you to know, um, and, and I've seen uh, Jeff give prepared talks, and, and you know it's a prepared talk, but he wants you to know what he's talking about. Uh, the sensibility, I mean, I just got such a good picture when you said that, because so much of what you're watching when you watch the news is somebody's kind of pitching you a story here. And, I want you to, and this is what I want you to understand about it. No, on to the next one. It's not really the kind of engagement and looking for you're going to really understand it, and we don't quite know what you're going to do with it. So I don't know if that's what you mean, but um, I think that's sort of a style that's evolved. And don't forget, these people are not only talking that way, and we've gone from you know 20 seconds to you know, ch check also not just what they're saying, but everything going on there. You got trailers along the bottom. You got things. You got people walking around. You got, I mean, it's completely nuts. You know, it's like, what do you want to look at? There's better be 15 things going at different speeds. So I think that's a style that's evolved, um, and it limits what you can communicate and who you can communicate it to, but that may be a good thing given what they want to do. What's your response to that? No, I think Completely it's right. different I, take. Right? I think it has to do with, with the way the media work. Um, if, you, if you give the, and, and this is the sort of the pre-electronic or the pre-web media, uh, if you give people uh, only three or four points and just keep hitting on them and hitting on them and hitting on them and hitting them, that's all that the, the press is going to be able to take home to report in their stories. And, and the people who do this are very good at it. I think the, in my last book I talked about what, what was up till about two or three years ago, the success of, of the Republicans and the right in doing this, in, in coordinating their stories so that the radio hosts, the people at the, uh, the think tanks and the institutes, the, um, the legislators, the, the politicians, were all hitting the same talking points. Uh, and Newt Gingrich's uh, list of uh, phrase, whatever it was, the contract for America and so on, 
was exactly that. Here are the, the phrases we're going to hit on. And whatever it happens, it's going to be the death tax. It's going to be uh, uh, family values and so on. And just hitting on those points over and over again. And it was very, and it remains, very effective as a means of communicating. Uh, what also is kind of funny, occasionally someone will hire me for a very big event, and they want me to be the MC, and and uh, and on occasion, you go and they have all those, those see-through uh, <coughs> panels so that you actually are seeing you know, what your speech is, what you're supposed to say. And I'm like, let me get this straight. For the next two and a half hours, you want me to just read what you have on the screen? <laughs> like, I can't do that. <laughs> I have to make up things. I have to say, didn't you just hear what that last guy said? Let's talk about what this guy's going to say. And so, I mean, it's, it, it is very formulaic. It's, that's exactly right. So we have the last question. You got that last already? Last question. I'll come up here. So I had this fascinating experience where I was informally pulling people on the word intimacy, and I would ask, um, what's the first words that come to mind when I say the word intimacy? And 80% of the time, people would say sex. Now, intimacy doesn't mean sex. And I'm wondering how we evolved, if you could comment on how, as a society, we've we've turned it to mean that. And then also, any ideas for how to respond to that? Because I, I struggle with how else to communicate the sort of work that we do without using intimacy. It, it's interesting and, 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 and a problem. Words that are used in some way euphemistically um, quickly acquire the color and the, the tone of the thing that they're being used. Like, I think of it as like draping sheets over the furniture and to, to hide the furniture, but it, 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 it takes the shape of the thing it's meant to, uh, to, 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 to cover. And, and that's the way things always work with euphemisms. Casualty began its life as a, a euphemism for death. Casualty was an accidental loss as in a casualty company and of course became no longer a, 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 a euphemism. And this is particularly true as, as, as words, with words that apply to, to, to sex, intercourse, uh, was uh, a roundabout way of talking about sex. And now, of course, if you say intercourse, even much more so than, than intimacy, uh, th th that's the only thing that comes to people's minds. Explicit language um, just means language that's explicit, except that if you talk about explicit language or You know warning, it's bad. Warning, <laughs> as it says on, on, on iTunes, explicit. You know, uh, 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 you know that they're not talking about explicit discussions of the economy. Right? <laughs> so so there, it's very hard to recover words um, from, from that when, once they've fallen, so to speak, the fallen euphemisms, uh, in the same way you can't imagine recovering any of these words or uh, collateral damage now. Uh, once a, a, a great euphemism now means civilian casualties. And I don't know, with, with intimacy, it's, it's a much greater loss than with some of these others. I, I agree with you, but I'm not sure if there's any way you can recover. Well, I have to say these are great questions, and you can all tell it's so easy to talk to, to Jeff forever. Now, Jeff, give us a little wrap of final thoughts here tonight. Well, it's going to be an interesting, um, uh, you know, I, just, I have a new book coming out. I wrote the introduction last because that's always with you. And I was thinking about, and this book is called The Years of Talking Dangerously, and it looks back at the last part of particularly the Bush years and the language of politics and so on. And I was thinking that language, that really sort of fell apart. Bush, uh, um, uh, in a speech uh, toward the end of his presidency, said, well, if I had something to do differently, I would have uh, probably wouldn't have said mission accomplished and so on and so on. But that, that all fell apart. That language <laughs> fell apart. And right now we're, we're in, the, in, 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 in this big economic mess. But my sense is that the language of American politics is going to change more in the coming decade than it's changed in the last 50 years. And I, I have no idea what direction it's going to take, uh, but I think it's going to be a very interesting time to be a linguistic observer. Well, you heard it here first, because when the book comes out, you're coming on Tech Nation, right? I'd be delighted. And I, I, you get I, to repeat it. But you heard it first. <laughs> That's the good reason to come to the San Francisco Maine Public Library. Absolutely. Jeff, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank Bessel. you. Thank you, Moira. Thank you. This is great. Thank you.